Go live. Go live Thursday night live. Live. I think we're live. Are we live? This is great. Hey, it's Thursday night. And that means it's time for little Torah. So Erev Tov. Uh, tonight's topic is on Hanukkah time machine. Blue, blue, blue. The idea of Hanukkah time machine came to me um, a few years ago when I was studying uh, kind of a, um, a diachronic study of, of the Hanukkah story and how the Hanukkah story doesn't take place in one static period of time. It actually is a story that asks of us to kind of step into this time machine of earliest stories from the Maccabees and like the second, third century before the common era. And then like, you got to strap yourself in for a ride because you're going to be wild and woolly to try to piece this thing together. And that's what we're looking at tonight. Uh, but before we start, I want to just say a few words about Thursday night live. First, we always begin with a blessing of Torah because learning is a is a blessing in and of itself. And we want to kind of bring that blessing to us. And so we say kind of with proper cover notes, inviting y'all there. By the way, I'm Rabbi Lori Shapiro of Open Temple in Venice, California. And tonight I'm coming to you from my home study because my, my study at Open Temple is uh, next to a um, rehearsal studio and our band is practicing tonight getting ready for Shabbat tomorrow night and you can check out our Shabbat tomorrow night we live stream it at opentemple.org so if you go to opentemple.org tomorrow night at 7 15 p.m pacific standard time you will see what this open temple is all about re-enchanting Judaism for the Jewishly curious and those who love us here in Venice California uh, tonight though I come from my home study which is underneath my children's room God help me, Baruch Hashem. All right, so this bracha, I'm going to kind of bring it in because I like to kind of drop in and get myself centered. And brachot, that's what they're there for. They're really tools. You know, if you're going to cut vegetables and get ready to cook, you're going to have a great knife. Well, if you're going to get yourselves ready to do learning, you're going to have a great bracha. So here we go. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'metzas tov l'pitzivanu, la'asok b'divrei Torah. Boom. I want to get busy with Torah. And so what Torah are we getting tonight? Well, first I want to just establish our covenant. And I've been noticing, you know, like this is a live show tonight. And so I, I just want to invite people to kind of place comments in Facebook. I've been noticing some comments in Facebook that were... Um, kind of like the less benevolent, which just means that something's being triggered. And that's why I bring in my covenant and covenant for learning. If you're being triggered, I want to remind you, I come from a place of love. And I think it's really cool if people have all sorts of images of what a rabbi looks like. At some point in my life, I did a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of study. I studied for 13 years. I was in Israel. I was in, it was in Philadelphia. I was in New York. I was in LA. And at some point they wanted to get me out of the seminary. And so they said, you're a rabbi. Hui! But I'm really just a chick who loves Torah. And if I don't look like a rabbi to you, that's cool. Whatever your idea of rabbi is, that's cool for you, and that's what feeds your soul. Some people call me rabbi. Some people call me Lori. I'm not saying I know anything esoterically uh, um, priv privileged information. I just like to study the texts and share it, and that's what I'm doing here. So in order to really go through the text, it's not how many times we study the text. It's how, many, how much the Torah goes through us. Uh, we must open our hearts to transformation, and maybe a part of that transformation is saying, I'm not going to get so hung up on this rabbi thing. You know, it's just like in America, a title that they created in a grad program, all right, creating a trade school for Jews. I think it's fine. I think it's it's something to struggle with, but in it, its essence, it is a vehicle for transformation. That's what my Jewish journey was that led me to the rabbinate, and I hope that your Jewish journey that leads you to whatever is one that leads your, your heart to transformation. I recommend getting a journal, legal pad, writing down some questions, making a grid, whatever it is that's going to aid in this transformation, go for it. And when judgments arrive, like, you know, if they arise in the mind, like, who is this chick who says she's a rabbi? Let it go. Or ask, you know, like, what's that about? Why am I so judgmental? You know, am I, am I being judgmental because something, someone hurt me in my life and told me I couldn't become something? That's really sad, you know? That's uh, right now there's uh, D'Angelo, a woman, D'Angelo, who's going around doing a lot of 
uh, education um, about white privilege and saying, you know, when we all say we're all the same on the inside, we're actually kind of ignoring the fact that there are systems in place that create prejudice and life isn't a big kumbaya. There are things that kind of cut people down. And when someone actually says, hey, you're not a real rabbi, maybe it's just an inverted experience of someone saying, hey, you're not a real whatever it is, you know, an overlording parent, a judgmental friend, whatever it is. So let's just kind of let it arise and find a mechanism to get it out. Then uh, I want to say on that note, there are many ways to do Jewish. This is just one way. And I thank David Suisa and the Jewish Journal for giving me a venue to share this one way. It's just one path that I'm offering tonight. I'd love to hear your path. Write it down in the comment section on Facebook. And finally, to Jewish denominationalism. You know, I say I am post-denominational. Uh, I think Jewish denominationalism roots itself in a 19th century innovation that occurred. We're going to talk a little bit about that time tonight. Um, we're all just Jews. It's a time of Klal Yisrael. And my love of Torah, I hope I can share with you. And I hope you write in the comments your love of Torah and share with me back. Okay, so where are we again in the calendar year? Well, we are in Kislev. It is the month of Hanukkah. Uh, we have a rededication in our lives. Hanukkah means to dedicate. So we are dedicating our lives to something. That's what Hanukkah asks us to do. We're getting to the very essence of the holiday. Uh, it's a very specific thing we're being asked to dedicate ourselves to. And that is to our Yehadut, to our Judaism. Next week, we're going to look at the book of Judith, which I think has some hidden meanings within it. Um, it's another book from Apocrypha. But speaking of Apocrypha, we're looking at the origins of Hanukkah, which also come from Apocrypha, which are the books that were not redacted into the Bible in the end. Um, we're stepping into the darkness. You know, the winter, the winter solstice is upon us. It's happening like right now. We're just entering into it. And with all of that darkness, I don't know about you, but I've been feeling like Shafal Ruach. I've been feeling like a lowly soul. And, and Hanukkah always comes to kind of give me a little light. Actually, for me, Hanukkah is the birth of my Jewish journey. I landed in Israel on the first night of Hanukkah and for the first time, and that's when my Jewish identity journey began. And so I, uh, I personally feel um, a real uh, revivification of my life. Every time Hanukkah comes, I, I come a little more alive. And then, um, you know, it's it's also a time for us to like take that light, take it in, but also cultivate it personally and allow ourselves to kind of be the lights that shine to others. We're also in an amazing part of the Torah that we're not looking at tonight. And we are in Parshat Vayeshev, which is the beginning of the greatest novella ever written, one might argue, the story of Joseph. And it is just, oh, it is exquisite literature. Anyone, I was an English major, so I'm a total geek about this stuff. But anyone who loves literature, you just have to open up the novella that is the story of Yosef. And it's so rich. And we're going to look a little bit more at that as well in juxtaposition with um, what is what we read when we look at something like Judith next week. We'll do a little bit of Joseph next week. But um, remember, he's dwelling in the land, Jacob and sons, Judah and Tamar. Oh, could have gone there tonight, didn't, felt a need to get ready for Hanukkah, but whoa, so much, you know, and then we have, you know, Mashiach ben David, which comes from Judah and Tamar, you have Mashiach ben Yosef, we're in the time of like incipient coming of redemption, all of this is happening here, and we depart tonight to go into the Hanukkah narrative, which is another great narrative. And what's interesting about the Hanukkah narrative is it's in juxtaposition in our tefillot. The rabbis um, kind of kept it akin to Megillat Esther. Both books or both legends lack the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the presence of a written Hashem in the stories. And what is that? You know, like, what does it mean that there's no presence of Hashem in these stories? like that there's no God. And and then I always go to the point of like, so what is God, right? Like, oh, it's so cool to sit in the darkness and kindle tiny, tiny flames and ask, where's the God in this? When the story doesn't have the presence, it's upon us in the darkness to find the light, to find Hashem, to find God. And so like the rabbis of the Bavli in Shabbat 21b ask, I will ask it as well, my Hanukkah. What is Hanukkah? 
Now, I could have done this next week, but like we'll be deep into Hanukkah. So I wanted to front load and get us ready. What is Hanukkah? I mean, it's this word. We said it earlier. It means dedication. Okay, that's cool. But like, what are we dedicating? You know, the book of Maccabees tells us that we were dedicating the temple. We were rededicating it after it was desecrated by the Assyrians, by the Greek Syrians. Okay, that's cool. But like, I got to go deeper into it. So my Hanukkah. Let's first look at the book of like the book of origin, because the book of origin is, is ponderous and it's not just one, it's two, right? And maybe there are more and we just don't know. They're out there and they're yet to be discovered. We'll find a great Geniza, a hidden burial of texts one day and find Maccabees three, four, five, and six, perhaps. But first I'm just going to focus on Maccabees one and then Maccabees two. So let's talk about Maccabees one. Maccabees one was written sometime in about the second century before the common era, roughly like 2,200 years ago, like not yesterday, a while ago. And Maccabees 2, it, Maccabees 2 was written then, um, they say maybe like 50 to 100 years later. So we've already entered anachronism. Remember, this is called Hanukkah time machine. So these two stories that you kind of weave together to be able to understand little kind of plot points of how we got Hanukkah or my Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah, um, tell us different things. The first one, um, again, we're told is is somewhere, you know, in the second, late second century before the or for early second century before the common era. And the second one is like a hundred years later. The second one we say is um, is written by like a Jason of Cyrene, right? And he, he, uh, it's dated after 110 uh, before the common era, but I have a theory about the second one because the second one reads very differently than the first one. The first one is truly a battle, right? And at the end they dedicate the temple again and, and they say it's the 25th of Kislev and the lamp light existed for, uh, they don't go there at all. They just say they rededicate the temple. Sorry, I get ahead of myself. But the, the second one is interesting because it has it has more um, florid language. It has more kind of a presence of a nationalistic spirit as if like like they're really kind of driving in the story of this Maccabean identity. And there's a part of me that fantasizes. I mean, this is what this crazy rabbi fantasizes about. But there's a part of me that has this fantasy that it was commissioned by Herod in the first century before the common era, that it isn't this Jason of Syrian, or maybe it is, but that maybe he was commissioned, although it would be anachronistic if it is 110 before the common era, because Herod was way later, but Herod like was obsessed with a nationalist identity, with like creating a neo kind of Judean, Jewish, Roman identity. And, and it just reads to me he was so over the top. It reads to me as a story that fits in very well with the legend of Herod. Now, Herod, you know, his name is mud to most people. I just find him fascinating. He, he kind of reminds me of a, a little bit of what's going on in our world today here in America. He's a fascinating character. Um, you know, he literally wanted to be the Messiah. He literally, in the end of his life, he had a kidney disease. Like maybe he was diabetic. And in, in his last days, he had like delusions, like almost like his blood was so poisoned that he had these like diabetic delusions running through the streets, shouting for the Messiah, that the Messiah had come. You know, this is about the year four after the common era. So maybe there was some baby somewhere crying, a little Jewish boy that eventually became the Messiah for the Christian world, but I get ahead of myself. But I look at the second book of Maccabees and I just, what I want us to really kind of consider is that it was this 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 text of of a rising nationalist identity and and that's a little bit of the two tensions the first one creates the story and the second one kind of kind of redacts it into this strong nationalist identity again you know we are talking 2100 years ago to 2250 years ago and even though it's like two millennia past this tension between nationalism an emerging self-identity is like exactly what's going on in America in 5780. It, it blows my mind, but like the idea of a nationalist identity versus like personal self-determination, that's a little bit or, or 
tribalist self-determination. That's like a little bit of what we have in our nation. And, and in addition, we also have this factionalism that is really reminiscent of 2000 years ago as well. So anyway, these two books, Maccabees 1, Maccabees 2, I digressed, we're back. Ooh, I told you it's a time machine. These two books, they're apocrypha, apocrypha, apocrypha. They were not redacted into the Hebrew Bible. And the rabbis had a reason why. They had really strong opinions about it. Uh, the books were about war. You know, the rabbis weren't cool with war. They were like, you know, we, we turn our swords into plowshares. Sorry, dude, this is a peaceful book. It's not to be a warring text. It's to be, supposed to be a, a pacifist text. And they wanted to also draw attention to, to like the soul, the human spirit. And war is the opposite of that. So the, the rabbis really had their own opinions and they had strong opinions about these books. They thought they were crude. Um, but interestingly, the story that we have today um, of Hanukkah doesn't resemble the book of Maccabees one or two. There's a lot missing. You know, those books give us historic information about battles and they even give us the idea of a defiled temple and the 25th day of Kislev. And, you know, some people say that they went in and they celebrated Hechag because they couldn't do Sukkot that year and because they were in battle. And so they finally get in and they, they have this eight day festival because they had to do the, the the great sacrificial, the sacrificial rituals of Sukkot. You know, that's really what happened over those eight days. But there's no mention of oil. There's no mention of light. There's no mention of miracles, right? So where did all of this information come from? And that is how we enter into the Hanukkah time machine. Ba -da 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 the Hanukkah time machine. Okay, so imagine a game of telephone. You're playing a game of telephone and someone comes up to you and they say this sentence. They say, I can't wait for Hanukkah because I love latkes and playing dreidel. And you're like, okay, okay, got it. And then you whisper into the person next to you, you whisper into their ear. And then the person next to you whispers into someone else's ear and you go like eight people down. And when you get to the end, the last person has to say the sentence. And the sentence that comes out is, I hope Santa Claus comes and visits my Christmas tree because I left him milk and cookies. Obviously, something is lost in the translation. And I'm not saying that it goes from Judaism to Christianity, but I'm trying to illustrate my point. And that is, most people can't get a game of telephone right in like 30 seconds. So if we can't get one sentence right in 30 seconds, how are we really supposed to know what the story was 2,250 years ago. And in fact, if we take this little moment of a game of telephone and we kind of break it down into different epochs, what we really kind of understand is that the story of Hanukkah is woven from many stories over millennia. So we're gonna look at how the story kind of evolved, evolved over time and also ask ourselves like when the rabbis ask my Hanukkah, Maybe they're doing that because there's an elasticity to the holiday, you know, like my Hanukkah, like what is Hanukkah in the sense of what is Hanukkah today? You know, the Talmud is not a static text. The Talmud is a conversation. It's like sound waves into the universe. And this static text, I mean, a non-static text invites us with alacrity and relevance to find out the answers to the questions today. Lo am he. It's right here. It's not in heaven. It's right here. And so the relevance of the question of what is Hanukkah is asking us, what is Hanukkah to me? But again, I get ahead of for myself. So let's look at some text. We spoke of Maccabees 1 and 2, how they really were focused on war. And the rabbis like were not so cool with that. And um, also they had this idea of like nationalism, versus self-determination, the idea of like assimilation versus like, you know, Jewish pride. Um, they had all these tensions and the rededication of the temple. That's where we get the idea of Hanukkah, the name. Um, and then also Sukkot was a late holiday that year. So it was in Kislev and Tevet. And um, we have to go into the time machine and see like, where did these other things that are missing come from? So I wanna, I wanna have a first stop in our time machine. <laughs> Go to Josephus. So Josephus, Yosef ben Matis Yahu, right? Even his name, right? How interestingly that 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 Josephus gives us a little 
little piece of Hanukkah and his antiquities. So Josephus, of course, is the famed Roman historian. He was um, a Jewish Roman historian and he wrote the antiquities of the Jews. And in it, I'm going to I'm going to read. He says, now Judas celebrated the festival of the restoration of the sacrifices of the temple for eight days. <gasps> what did we just get there? Eight days. Yeah, that was missing before. But here we go. We can find the origins of it in Josephus. And from that time to this, we celebrate this festival and all of its lights. Ha! Ah, what do we get there? We get the lights. Yes. I suppose the reason was because the liberty beyond our hopes appeared to us and that hence was the name given to this festival. So Josephus is reclaiming this idea of this idea of liberation, this idea of the lights. Again, like... Maccabees had nothing to say about light, and Josephus introduces that idea. So slowly, from a time of war, we see that we kind of move forward in about the first century after the Common Era, and we get a little bit of a glow, right? A little bit of a glow of a light. We're not totally like, you know, spiritually like sitting in the darkness and humming some sort of like great deep meditative chant, but we're getting like the beginning of light and how this holiday evolved. So Josephus gives us light, but where's the miracle? Where's the menorah? And where's the oil? Well, for that, we have to enter into the time machine again. Right? And we, we land in the Talmud Bavli. Now the Talmud Bavli is complex, as we know when we study Talmud that you have um, you have the early rabbis, and you have the Amorim, and, and then later on you have you have the the redactor. Um, so you have this kind of meta text that wove it all together, um, and you put you put the three layers of Talmud and even more together, and and you have like a, a 3D text over time. But the rabbis in Talmud uh, 21b, Shabbat 21b, and the Bavli famously ask my Hanukkah, and in that they're implying what is the reason for Hanukkah. So they respond, because they ask a question, then they respond. They say, for the rabbis taught that on the 25th of Kislev, which they probably got from the book of Maccabees, so you could see their origin text, which they then are trying to refocus us, right? You'll see how they refocus us. They say this they learned from the book of Maccabees too. The, they say the day of Hanukkah, which are eight, on which lamentation for the dead and fasting are forbidden. Whoa, pause, time there. This is significant. So they're saying, okay, you have the 25th of Kislev and you have eight days, all right? So they're adding on what we already learned from uh, Josephus and earlier because they, we're, we're saying that the final redactor of the Talmud perhaps was later. Um, and they're saying, oh, you can't do lamentation for the dead. You can't fast. So we're getting like halacha, hilchot, Hanukkah, how interesting. And then they say, for when the Greeks entered the temple, they defiled all the oils therein. And when the Hasmonean dynasty prevailed against and defeated them, they made search and found only one cruise of oil, which lay with the seal of the high priest. Oh my gosh, this whole legend's being written right here, right now. And it's like totally, totally a complete divergence from the Maccabee story. But it's in this Talmud Shabbat 21b that you get this idea of oil, you get this idea that they found it, you get the idea of the seal of the high priest, so they're bringing in a little bit of the Sadducees, and then they're saying, but it contains sufficient oil for one day only, yet a miracle was wrought therein. Neskadol <gasps> hayapo, a great miracle happening here right now. So the rabbis are like, there was a miracle. And the lamp, which only had enough for one day, lasted for eight days. Bam! This is where it comes from. It's not from the story of Maccabees. It's not from Josephus's historic account. It's from much later on. I mean, as we know, the Talmud was redacted any time between like the 6th and 7th century after the Common Era. So this is almost like, you know, eight, seven or 800 years later, maybe. I mean, it could have been an earlier rabbi writing uh what it was and it was finally woven in but but you know it, it could be the stom of the text as well which is the later voice I, I don't know i didn't i didn't uh i didn't write it but i i can say that this could be as late as six or seven hundred years later and you're finally getting the miracle and you're finally getting the oil i think that's pretty cool um because it existed all that time before then were they lighting candles in the year like 84 after the common era i don't know so then they say the following year, these were appointed a festival on the reciting of Halal on Thanksgiving, which is the rabbis also um, suggesting that it was Sukkot. 
So um, this is a big deal. Okay, we move the story away from the Hasmoneans, and we're 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 going towards the concept of the the nace, or the concept of the of the miracle, and and it's amazing because what the rabbis are doing, they were halachic, they were into Jewish law, but they were also bringing in, they were bringing in neshama, they were bringing in soul, they were bringing in the idea of like a miracle, right, of life, right, of like oh my God, who could believe it? They were bringing in the hidden presence of Hashem as being kind of the, the promoving force of miracle. And so this is grandly significant. Um, and, and they were also bringing in the priests. And, and again, the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they didn't get along, but they're, they're, they're preserving. You know, by this point, if we're looking that it was maybe the voice of the Psalm, it's much later on, and it probably wasn't. It was probably an earlier rabbi. But, you know, the idea that they were preserving the priests says they were less insecure about it. They were like, yeah, they existed then. We won, but yeah, they existed then. And then they're saying that the rabbis want to recast the story and they want to say, this is not about a priestly victory. This is about a rabbinic victory. And that's the voice of the rabbis in Shabbat 21b, right? Because like, they're still there to tell the story in the end. Who, who is really the victors of any civilization? The ones, of course, who can write the history. But think about the Jewish writers, you know, and their victories. We write history and we inspire the soul to illuminate a presence greater than ourselves. How beautiful is, is Jewish history? How beautiful is the concept of the Jewish imagination of rewriting history? We're going to rewrite history with a meaning, a meaning of a presence of something that we seek in our lives that we call God. I just think that's stunning. But it kind of reminds me of what's going on in the world today, because what's going on in the world today is, you know, we get a criticism of nationalism, and yet we have rising nationalism. We have deep identity formation, tribalism. You know, in the ancient world, you had sectarianism, you had Sadducees and Pharisees and Essenes and Zealots and Samaritans and rising new sects that would be Come known as Christians, Roman gods and pagans, as well as a melting pot of religions that was all happening at once. And so the rabbis took this opportunity to elucidate who we are. We are the people of finding light in the darkness. We are the people of the miracle. We can see the presence of, of the forces of light over darkness, like, like Star Wars is opening tomorrow. And here we have an ancient Manichaeism, light over darkness. The rabbis here are creating early Judaism through Hanukkah. The miracle of Hanukkah is this idea that Judaism keeps evolving. And for me, this is really my closer for the night. It's this idea, you know, it, it's so oftentimes taught as this, first of all, this, this story that is just, you know, fiction, it doesn't really exist. And then it's also taught as like the purity of the Maccabees and the triumph over assimilation. And I say, bah to that, I say, bah. I say, no, it's Dafka because of assimilation we're still here. And what is the greatest of assimilation? It's assimilating. It's, it's taking in and assimilating and adapting in the face of other cultures. And that's what the story of Hanukkah at its essence is about. It's the dedication of the Jewish people to find enlightenment all around us and to allow us to assimilate the enlightenment of other cultures and other peoples into our story that only strengthens and endows each and every one of us with a, a firmer path to seek godliness in our lives. That is the miracle of Hanukkah, that we continue to assimilate. When we say the prayer, when we say the prayer, al hanisim ve al haporkan ve al hagvorot ve al hachuvot ve al ha nifla ve al ha milchamot shasitan avotenu vayemim hahem vazmanaze, when we really think this concept of something greater than ourselves for miracles, for this concept of redemption, of being able to get back up when we're down, when we are able to discern incredible acts that transcend our ability to comprehend them, the mighty deeds, when we can find redemption in our lives through the tiniest acts of kindness, when we can see all of that happening and we see despite war, despite defeat, despite 
despite challenges in our lives, when we see that we endure, that is the miracle of the season. And so I end with a concept of hope saying whatever challenges we have before us as individuals, as a group, as a nation, as a people, as, as Jews, it is upon us to rise into the light, to assimilate through it, to take the tiny grains of miraculous wisdom and allow that to fortify us and redeem us. And that's why it says, by Yamim Hahem, as it was done in the past, Basman Hazay, like until right now, right now, it keeps going. Hanukkah time machine. I mean, who knows what Hanukkah is going to be in 3,000 years? I have to say, I can't wait to get in the time machine and find out. <laughs> have a beautiful, beautiful Hag Sameach. Shabbat Shalom. Tomorrow night, opentemple.org. Check out our Shabbat service. We will be meeting the forces of evil and light and darkness all at once at Open Temple. And I invite you to go to our live stream or even come visit us at Electric Lodge. And so much love and so much light, and see you next week.